I do not like to lose. I just don't like it. If we compete at something, I want to win. Because to me, if you're not trying to win, there's no sense in playing. That's just how it is. So, kids are growing up. I didn't let them win. Now, I may not have tried as hard as an adult, but I didn't just let them win. Of course, Austin's paying me back because he won't let me win at golf now, so he keeps beating me all the time. I guess he's getting me back for that. But probably most of us are that way. Well, let me put it this way. There are a whole bunch of women I've talked to that they're not fun to play games with because they don't really care. Win, don't win, just play. I just I can't get into that. So when we talk about being conquered for Jesus, it sort of goes against human nature to say, I want to win. Until we reinterpret and define well what it means to win. But tonight, <clears throat> think with me about being conquered for Jesus. This morning we learned that we are more than conquerors. And now we need to understand that as Christian people, we must be conquered for Jesus. I want you to consider with me the case of Saul. Saul was a man who was conquered by Jesus before he could be conquered for Jesus. Let's notice together this idea of Saul of Tarsus. His beginning, of course, was a beginning of trying himself to conquer Jesus. He wanted to win. He wanted to overcome Jesus. We learn about his conversion in three passages of Acts 9, Acts 22, and then, of course, in Acts 26. Now, the story we know well. He was traveling for the purpose of participating in persecuting Christians. In Acts 22, in that account, here's what he said about himself. Number one, he was brought up as one who was a strict Jew. He followed the Jewish law. But he was one who participated in bringing people who opposed the Jewish law, they needed to face persecution because they were violating his God. He says in Acts 22, I persecuted this way even unto death. He was one who participated at the stoning of Stephen. He would say that he stood by and held the coats of those who were hurling rocks at him, stoning him to death. He admitted, I killed, helped to kill Stephen. He was fighting Jesus because he thought Christianity was fighting God. 
And therefore, it would made perfect sense to him. I have to stop this. I have to compete. I have to conquer this. I cannot let this win. And he went so far as to persecute the people who were following that path. But he had to be conquered first. If he is going to be conquered for Jesus, he himself had to be conquered by Jesus. In the midst of trying to destroy him, we find a whole different scenario. We find him confronting for the first time what he was really doing. On that road. In Acts 9, if you've read it a number of times... There are some things in there that make you wonder. And how did this turn out this way? Acts chapter 9. As he's riding down the road heading toward Damascus, you remember the great light shone and it blinded him. And then he hears this voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The next response is interesting. Who are you, Lord? Now, it is possible that when he said, Who are you, Lord? He was simply saying, Whoever this is, you're better than I am. And therefore, recognizing a greater authority, he just said, Lord. But let me suggest another possibility. What do you want? Lord, who are you? I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. Was that the first time that he had ever been confronted by Jesus? I don't think so. He says to the Philippians in chapter 3, he referred to it also in Acts 22, he said, I was a Pharisee. He called himself a Pharisee of all Pharisees. I was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, one of their great teachers of the Jewish law. And he said, of the strictest sect, blameless in the law. I mean, if you're going to identify who is a top-notch, number one Jewish person you would have said Saul of Tarsus. But I don't think this was his first confrontation with Jesus. For instance, we know that he was an apostle, right? Called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Especially in, in, in chapter 26 when he's telling the story, he talks about God had called me to be a light to the Gentiles. So there was, in fact, a plan for Saul. He was appointed an apostle. Now, he had to defend this a number of times. Especially in his writings to the Corinthians, he had to defend the fact that he was an apostle. He says he was out of due season called. In other words, these other guys, and then sometime later, me, he had to defend that. Go back to Acts 1. When Judas Iscariot killed himself after betraying Jesus, 
Peter quoted a passage that says, let another take his place. They put up two men, and then they cast lots, God using that procedure to show them who it was that he wanted to take the place of Judas. But then Peter said, of these two have accompanied us, all the time with Jesus' ministry were witnesses of His miracles and saw Him after His resurrection. Of these two, God wants Matthias. Notice the qualifications to be an apostle. Travel with Jesus witness his ministry and all that he did, and see him after his resurrection. Now, think about this. What happened in Matthew chapter 23? I'll give you a minute. You know, we had that class on pew packers for adults. I wonder if you're recalling that. We might need to do that again. We got some good comments about that. But what happened in Matthew 23? Over and over again in the chapter, Jesus berated, rebuked the Pharisees and the scribes, and he called them hypocrites. Everything, the chapter begins, that they tell you to do, do it. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not. Now, Saul was a Pharisee. He was a strict follower of the law. Had you ever considered that maybe he was standing there? when Jesus was handing it to those Pharisees? Do you think he heard the rebuke of his sect of Jewish people personally from the lips of Jesus? I know this. He already knew who he was. He had to have been around during the time of Jesus. He had to have, been, have spent a lot of time with him to see his miracles. And he had to have seen him after his resurrection or he didn't meet the qualifications to be an apostle. I wonder, when he heard that voice on the road... It was the same voice that he heard that he had followed during the ministry of Jesus. So when he said, who are you, Lord? He wasn't saying, I don't know your name. I think he was saying, I thought you were this person. So really, who are you? And now, he was confronted with who Jesus really was. You don't make a turn as quickly as he did without some kind of context to produce the change. And I think in that moment, he was able to pull back into his life the things he had seen and heard from Jesus. And now he said all of a sudden, this is special. What do you want me to do? It may be that that sermon, that message that Jesus gave to those Pharisees 
was something that stuck in his mind. And now he's ready. Now he, going to Damascus to conquer those people, he now was conquered himself. And for three days, he fasted and prayed. But obviously he was not a saved person. Because when Ananias in the city finally told him, Arise and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It is taught in many religious groups that a person should have a Damascus Road experience to be saved. And I would rather say that a person should have a Damascus action experience to be saved because in Damascus he was immersed into Jesus Christ. If he was saved on the road three days ago, why does he now need to have his sins washed away three days later? It makes no sense. Here's a guy now conquered by Jesus, is now ready to be conquered for Jesus. 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 12. What does it mean to be conquered for Jesus? Well, here's what it meant to Saul. He's a believer. He's a believer. What kind of believer is he? For this reason, I suffer these things. He's a suffering believer. Maybe he more than anybody else felt I got to pay back what I used to do. I'm willing to suffer. To be conquered for Jesus means I'll suffer. I don't expect it to be easy. I don't expect it to go my way. I don't expect that everything will work out so beautifully and so wonderfully, and it'll be like uh, tripping through the roses and smelling the beautiful scent. There are Christian people who, when encountering suffering, turn their backs on Christianity. They were not conquered by Jesus. So they're not willing to be conquered for Jesus to suffer. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. He's a suffering, unashamed believer. I don't care what people say. I don't care how they deride me, persecute me, speak and laugh about me. I'm going to be this person. Some Christians want to have a good relationship and reputation among people of the world. And when shamed... They fade into the dark because they're not willing to face it. If you can't face people being critical of you without being ashamed of your faith, you've not been conquered for Jesus. 
I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. He's a suffering, unashamed, convinced believer. When times of shame, times of, of suffering come, is the first thought to doubt? If so, then you've not yet been conquered for Jesus. Are you willing to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and say, this I know? I am persuaded that he is able. He's a suffering, unashamed, convinced, confident believer. Oh, he's been conquered for Jesus. If someone walks up to you tonight and says, if you leave this world tonight, will you be rewarded with heaven? Can you confidently say, Yes. If not, you need to work on being conquered for Jesus. Able to keep what I committed to him until that day. A suffering, unashamed, confident, convinced, committed believer. Committed. No way out. No other options. I'm all in. I never even think about getting out. That's Paul. He was conquered for Jesus because he had been conquered by Jesus. Now let's apply it to you and me. We are people that need to make sure that we have been conquered by Jesus. We need to make sure so that we can then be conquered for Jesus. 1 John 5. Number one, he says you better be a believer. I've written these things to you that you believe. John wrote that if you're going to be conquered for Jesus, you have to be a believer. I have to be a believer. I need to believe that Jesus is who he said he was, and that's it. No other options. That's it. That you might believe in the name of the Son of God, verse 13, and that you may know. If I've been conquered for Jesus, I know. I know by experience. I know by reading. I know by application and understanding. I know by wisdom. I know. If you've been and if I've been conquered for Jesus, I'm conquered to know what he wants and who he is. And I know to be conquered 
for Jesus is to look past this life to the next. The biggest problem we have is this life. That's it. It's the biggest one we have. <laughs> well, since that's the only one we have right now, I can see why. We have to be people, if we're conquered for Jesus, all of this pales to that. Conquered for Jesus. And that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. You see, you start with belief and it rolls into belief and it just keeps going. So my belief makes me endure the suffering. It teaches me the truth that I know to be true. It helps me look forward to the reward, and therefore I keep believing so that I keep handling the suffering. And I keep learning the things that I need to know. And I keep looking for the reward so that I believe, and then I do it again. Conquered for Jesus after being conquered by Jesus. Jesus. In other words, didn't Jesus say, whoever wants to keep his life must first do what? What? Lose it. Okay. If you want to be conquered by Jesus, you got to be a loser. Got to be a loser. And in the way the world looks at it, that's exactly what you are. You're a loser because you're a Christian. Look what everything you're missing. Yeah. But look at everything we're going to get. I don't like to lose. I really don't. Just ask Owen. We played on a basketball Nights. And I don't know how it was. I was always on his, not on his team. And I always had to guard him. And so I would just saddle him up and I'd ride on top of him, man. I don't know how else to do it. And I lost. I don't like it. But I need to get to the point that I can finally say I want to lose. And in losing, I'm being conquered. By Jesus, for Jesus. And until I'm willing to lose all of this, it'll be a struggle. And I'm working on it. I'm working on it continually. I hope you are too. Is it odd to say that I want to be around a church of losers? I do. I want to be around a whole group of people who consider themselves losers so they can be winners. Jesus calls you to be conquered. If you've not been, we're willing to help you. Whatever need you have from surrendering for the first time to coming back and surrendering again, are you convinced that you've been conquered. If not, can we help you while we stand and sing together?